Since the beginning of time, the foods eaten by Indian people living along the rivers of the Northwest were common amongst all tribes. Fish, game, roots, berries, even moss, and the living layer of some trees were a central part of life. The rhythms of life at that time were based on where and when these foods were available. Salmon was the central food for which people depended upon. It was plentiful. It was the major food that people depended upon for life, feeding the body, mind, and soul. We're part of the salmon. Salmon's our blood. We was raised on salmon. Salmon is spiritual. It's a food, it's a way of life. During the spring and summer, Indian people would travel from great distances to traditional fishing grounds as the salmon would return to spawn. Salmon fishing is uh, very important to our culture. I mean, that's, that's the way we live. Other than, you know, the berries and the hunting, and the root gathering, but salmon was one of our main means of sustenance, I guess you could say. Places like Kettle Falls, Salado Falls, and the mouth of the Okanagan River were just some of the fishing grounds people would travel to. They also had special spiritual significance and played prominently in the legends and stories passed down from generation to generation. Salmon fishing was a, was a main source of food at one time before all these dams came in. And, uh, you know, that's, uh, our folks used to tell us that's your brain food. That's what, uh, you know, kind of gets into our way of life, this fish. It's the mainstay of, uh, that, and when we set our table, even at our longhouse or even at home on Sundays, when we set our table, you have the salmon is the first food, the deer and the elk is the second food, your roots are the third food, the berries, but most important of all, the, none of these things, animal life or plant life, cannot survive without water. We need to take care of our water. That's how these things are set up. That's how we was taught. And that's, that's part of a, a way of life for us. Salmon fishing, to me, is, uh, hey, that's our culture. I mean, I've heard stories about our people back at Kettle Falls, long before they put in the dams. So all the tribes, you know, all the tribes in the area would would gather at Kettle Falls. For the tribes, the traditional way of life began to end as the treaties with the U.S. government were signed, pushing people off their historical lands onto reservations. As the dams began to be built, life for tribal members changed forever. One of the first dams to be built was Grand Coulee Dam in 1939. Its construction, with no fish ladder, forever stopping salmon from reaching the upper Columbia River and Kettle Falls. This had a devastating effect on tribal members. You gotta kinda look back 60 years, over 60, almost 70 years, and say, okay, we just, we just wiped out a big fishery on the Columbia River above Grand Coulee Dam. So you got Keller, you got Rogers Bar, Kiwa, and all those little places that all had tribal people, and even some non-tribal, all the way to Kettle Falls, that were depending on that, that river to bring in their food source. It's no longer there. When, you, when your people lived that way all your life and that's how you went and, and uh, gathered your food and it's taken away from you and cut off, it's a disaster. Uh, it's, it's, it violates your rights. It's, it's, just like, uh, it's just like telling you, uh, okay, you don't get to eat anymore. That's just about what it's saying. And you're gonna have to go elsewhere to find your food. Changed the whole way of life for our people. We used to be fishermen and uh, probably 60% of our, our food source came from salmon. There was uh, a lot of anger when that happened. And uh, like I said, the Cowboys and Indians was pretty strong in our our country then until they give us the right 
fought for their rights. The Cobbill tribe, God bless them, has fought for rights for us for years and years. After Grand Coulee Dam's lake flooded Kettle Falls and Chief Joseph Dam was built in 1955, tribal members were forced to travel to the mouth of the Okanagan River to fish. And when Grand Coulee Dam got put in, that did away with our fishery at Kettle Falls. And after that, everybody just kind of, I mean, forgot about salmon fishing. But there were a handful of people that went down the mouth of the Okanagan and started catching sockeye down there. And once in a while, somebody would hook into a Chinook. There's 12 different tribes here. And most of them depended on salmon as a main mainstay, main food source. And uh, when, that, when that fish came, and then everybody just went down there and everybody fished and enjoyed each other's company. Wells Dam was constructed in 1967. That dam, although built with a fish ladder, flooded the mouth of the Okanagan River, stopping tribal members from fishing at their last traditional fishing ground. Yet. Some fishermen found a way to continue to fish there. Oh yeah, and then uh, even now I go down there at night. I fish at night time. I don't fish during the daytime. I fish at night time, all night long. But I take my poles down there and put them together, <clears throat> and then uh, dip right along the banks. You look at the river from like from the bridge. You look down there. You can see where the current is. So I had to go position myself where I can reach down into the, the moving water. Chief Joseph Dam is located in north central Washington on the Confederated Tribes of the Cabo Reservation. It's one of the 14 dams built on the Columbia River to generate electricity and to provide water for irrigation. Chief Joseph Dam was built without a fish ladder and became the last fishery for tribal members. With the salmon permanently stopped at Chief Joseph Dam and the mouth of the Okanagan River flooded, Tribal fishermen from the lakes, Cabo, Okanagan, Moses Columbia, Wenatchee, Inyat, Chelan, Methow, Nespilum, San Puel, Chief Joseph Nez Perce, and Palouse tribes were all forced to learn how to fish off the dam. Holy cow, that's a big boy, huh? The people go where the salmon are, see? Well, Chief Joe Dam didn't put it in a ladder. The salmon had no place to go. The importance of us having our fish and salmon, of course, you have to adapt in, in that. It's important everywhere. It's important to, to fish off of the, the Chief Joe Dam for us because it's getting to be our last fishing hole. It became a learned science. There were uh, guys my age and, and older that became professional fishermen and adapted as Indian people to a uh, a new way of uh, salmon fishing and probably invented a, a whole new way to harvest salmon. So not only did uh, salmon adapt to the river, but the Indian adapted to the river, to the dams. Uh. It wasn't until 1971 my cousin, uh, Petey Gujan, he uh, talked me into going down there. I didn't care to go down, but he talked me into going down. and. Heck, I started hooking in them big Chinooks, and I really, really got into it after that. Fishing at the dam was different than anything the fishermen had ever experienced before. Trying to catch fish on top of the generators, on the rocks, the wall, and the corner took different techniques for each spot. They were forced to adapt. I seen schools that would take four minutes to go by, 80 feet wide, Four minutes to go by. I don't know, it's, it's quite a feeling to, to see like a hundred salmon in the school. And you think, gosh, it's just gonna be easy. I'm just gonna cast down there and I'll hook one every time. Well, it just don't happen that way. I mean, I've, I've casted more than one time into a big bunch and come away with nothing. And yet other guys I can see that spend a lot of time there. They'll see one and they can cast out there and. Nine times out of ten, they'll be hooking that salmon, you know. But I think it's like anything else, it, you just develop that skill. And uh, me and my partners, we go over in the mornings, we fish down in the rocks on the Indian side, and then we fish there till 
oh, say like noon or 11 o'clock, and then we go over to generators. Because the, the fishing's pretty good on the Indian side and the rocks in the morning, and then on the other side, it's been, the fish don't seem to come in there till about one o'clock. So we've kind of kind of got them fish figured out a little bit, but not a whole lot. There's uh, various ways we catch them. We can, uh, afternoons, you could use a little lure they call a buzz bomb. You can throw it way out and just kind of work it. Uh, nighttime, you could use big red and white spoons. But the main way we catch them down there is uh, either blind snagging or spot snagging. Blind snag on the rocks, you know, in the evening time or early in the morning. Or you blind snag over in them generators. Well, the blind snagging part of it is when you're you're just throwing your hook out in, into a current of water. And what you're trying to do is you're trying to guess by the weight of your hook how far you should let your line sink. If it's a shallow place, then you probably don't want to let it sink over three seconds before you begin your jerk. If it's deep, you can let it sink as much as five to eight seconds, depending uh, on the depth of the water. Everybody had a favorite spot. People fished on the wall, various places up and down the wall with different types of poles, different tests of line, different apparatus. When you're blind snagging, you don't see a fish. You're just going, you know they're out there. You know they're in the current. You know they're out there. You're just throwing out and guessing that I'm, I'm gonna put the, the by, by my letting this line go down X amount of place, time, I'm gonna guess that that's gonna go right into the fish. I more or less am a, uh spot snagger, I stand on that wall, I wait for the fish to come by, they get tired out in the generators, or they think, I guess they think they can go upstream there, they get attracted to that hard water, and they try to find a way to go further upstream, and they get tired, and they come out, and they go along that wall in that still water, yeah, and that's when I, I just stand there and wait for them to come by, and if I see them, I just, so out ahead of them, other side of them, try to just meet, have my line meet, meet the fish and line up and hook them. Get the thrill of hooking one and fighting the fish because, you know, basically you don't catch them by the mouth, you got them by the tail. And fighting the big salmon and currents uh, get you pumped up and adrenaline flowing when you hook into one culture of fishing at Chief Joe Dam became uh, traded, the things that were learned, the secrets about fishing, where to fish, how to fish were readily shared with one another in the quest to uh, get salmon to feed the people. That's always been the, the uh, resolve of the Indian people is to uh, be subsistence hunters and fishermen and feed the population never to waste or spoil, but only to use what you need and you harvest it with good heart and with respect for the commodity and then you uh, share it with others. Handing down stories to our children and teaching fishing techniques has been a key part of Indian life. Passing on the knowledge through storytelling continues even today. Just the day's work there. Yeah. My mother and father and my aunts and uncles, they all talked to me and made us sit down and watch, listen and learn, young man. It's going to be important to you someday. So we had to go down there and watch and then uh, learn the behavior of the fish and then take advantage of that. Well, I like to say the old time fishermen, they're mostly all gone now. But there was kind of like, we, we had our own unwritten sort of rules that were actually the way how we, that governed how we, we fished and stuff. Well, the elders, the, the fishermen there before, they could spot you when you stepped on the wall, they knew you didn't know what you was doing. 
So they'd come by and teach you. They're really good at it. They'd come by and they'd teach you. First of all, they'd teach you the rules of the wall, <laughs> how to stay out of everybody else's way and not to crowd and not to run up and down the wall. Then they'd teach you how to fish. They'd show you. They'd always come by and tell you different ways of what you're doing wrong. That's how I learned. Down at the Chief Joe, the learned process is there, is that the elders teach the young. And it's to our benefit. Salmon was the major part of our diet. It was the mainstay of what we ate. It's said that 60% of our food was salmon. Today, we eat a smaller portion of what we used to. Many think that the current health problems people face are caused because we don't eat enough salmon. Fishing along the river and holding a pole in your hands are healing experiences, which helps many people both physically and spiritually. Now what are you going to do, Pete? Said you caught that one. Catch more. <laughs> we have taught many, many young people about the healing process here because we all would share with them, young folks, about using this as their power. How do you get any higher than you are right now, see? Why do you need to mess up your mind? And I've seen a lot of people, many, many people give up their drinking and give up their drugs. But that's the kind of lure that goes to that water. When I said it was healing waters, yeah, that's the kind, that's the thing that happened. Because not everyone can fish, Tribal fishermen supply fish to elders, family, and friends. This traditional sharing continues today. True salmon fishing, the true part of it is not just the harvest of it, it's the giving. That was our way we was brought up, that's tradition. And, uh, if you had salmon in your freezer and there's a funeral, you went and offered it. You offered what you had to help feed the fish that's harvested or brought up to the Indians that can't travel or don't have the fuel or vehicle to go get it themselves anymore. So when it's brought up to them, it's a real celebration for the people that get the salmon. And it's funny how, how uh, important that it is in, our, in the elder society for our people to show generosity. That was a thing. That was a thing with the natives that they had to show that they were generous, show that they were understanding, um, you know, compassionate. Soon after the dams were built, the numbers of salmon returning to spawn began to decrease. Environmental changes in the ocean, fluctuating weather patterns, wet years and dry years, and more and more people fishing have taken a toll upon the salmon runs. For example, in the 1970s, tribal fishermen at the Chief Joseph Dam used to catch 100 to 150 fish a year. In the 80s, that number declined to 60 to 70 per year. And in the 90s, it fell to 40 to 50 per year. Over the years, the Cabo Confederated Tribes, other tribes, and state and federal agencies worked together to increase the number of salmon returning. Hatcheries are a major component of the restoration effort. The $50 million state-of-the-art hatchery greatly increases numbers of Chinook salmon in the rivers as well as reintroducing spring Chinook to the Okanagan River. So it was built uh, in part for uh, you know lost habitat and to try and return salmon uh, to the people not only as a an important food source that was taken away but you know it's also a very um, cultural icon and uh, very important to to the tribes. Protecting the salmon's natural genetic information is a critical part of the work done at the hatchery. Salmon returning to the Okanagan River and Chief Joseph Dam are either natural origin or hatchery origin fish. It's important to separate the two kinds of fish so the natural fish are allowed to spawn on the Okanagan River. These natural fish are also used as broodstock in the hatchery. Once the salmon eggs have grown into fingerlings, they're ready to be taken to the Okanagan River for final rearing and release. Both types of fish are subject to harvest. The idea is to keep the genetics as close as possible to the original naturally occurring salmon. The goal is to limit the returning hatchery fish from spawning up the Okanagan River and only allowing the natural fish up river to spawn.
Cobble Fish and Wildlife Biologist accomplishes by netting live fish with a purse sayer at the mouth of the Okanagan River. They also construct a weir further up the river. The weir is like a gate across the river where the fish are funneled through. Here they are collected and sorted. These two techniques are part of the process for separating the hatchery fish from the natural fish. And so with any hatchery program, you know, 100% of our fish are going to be marked for harvest um, and they will be available. And so the benefits are, are, are big. Here locally, um, you know, we expect that our adult returns are going to, you know, probably double or possibly even triple from what they are currently. At the dedication of the new hatchery, tribal fishermen were honored and asked to speak. When I first started fishing down here, uh, it was like a community of fishermen. We all shared. No one, uh, if you, had, if you needed anything, anybody helped me out. It was, uh, it was its own community. Us guys from Mitch Lamb and all over the place, we'd meet down here and we'd have some hellish stick games. And then we'd wrestle, and then we'd play, and then we'd drink some beer, and then we'd go fish. It was just a blast. The old fishermen, they never liked the young kids in the rocks crossing the line. The gores and the snakes would throw out, and somebody cross your line and put their thing in. George would rip it up, or Bernie smoked a cigarette, and they just grab it, you're tangled up, and they grab the hook, and they'd burn their hook off and throw it in the trap. <laughs> Fishing at Chief Joseph Dam will always be an important part of the relationship between Indian people and the salmon, providing for generations to come the opportunity to harvest fish, continuing the traditions, culture, and the spirituality surrounding this fishery. But I think people need to know about this fisheries. People need to know that it's more than just going down and standing in a hot place and jerking for salmon. It's, it's part of the, who they are personal makeup or way of life. It's part of the identity of being an Indian. So I think it's critical that we hang on to that little part of the corner of our reservation that we have half the river to fish out of, uh, right at the base, all the way across, that we spend the kind of resources so 60 years from now and 5,000 years from now the Cabo people are still fishing and still getting salmon. I would say it's the number one priority that we keep our fishing spot at Jeep Joe. That our people have a right to go down there and catch their fish and take them home. It's your way of life, it's your right, it's been your career since time began. Before our dams were even thought upon this river, so yeah, I believe it's number one.